Advent is all about the waiting. It's all about the expectancy. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that this, this morning. But when we think about hope, the reality is we literally can't live without hope. We literally can't live without hope. And when you think of all the other religions, when you think of, when you, when you think of other religions and, 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 and things like that, the thing that separates Christianity apart is our hope. Because we have Jesus, we have a Savior that came and made a way for us to have access and fellowship with God eternally. And so hope at Christmas, I always get excited to do this message at Christmas at the Advent uh, time to kick off Christmas because hope is really what separates Christianity, it's really what separates Jesus' people from all the rest because of Jesus. Because of Jesus. Because of Jesus. And, um, and so we literally can't live without hope. You can't stay healthy without something to look forward to. You can't stay healthy without something to look forward to. Uh, many of you know, for those of you that don't, the reason I'm wobbling around, or uh, some of you have called me gimpy, and that's very offensive. Um, but uh, <laughs> you know, the reason I'm doing that, I had knee surgery a couple weeks ago, and, and right after I was recovering from knee surgery, it was, I think it was two days, uh, Bria had a school dance, and so one of the things that we like to do before her school dance is take her out to dinner and remind her of all the rules, you know. Um, with the school dance, right? Um, and, uh, and, so, and so I was looking forward to all day. I was like 48 hours after surgery, and I'm laying on you know, the couch. I'm laying around like a, you know, with my knee propped up and all that stuff, being, being good, being good, all you nurses and, and all, that, all you moms. I was being good. And, um, but I, I couldn't wait to go to dinner. I had something to look forward to. All day, all day, I was in a better mood than I was the day before because I knew that I was going to Lucky Tie at about 5 o'clock before the middle school dance, and I just couldn't wait. Now, when I got to Lucky Tie and felt the pain of actually being out, I had different feelings. But that's beside the point. Leading up to it all day, I had something to look forward to. And actually, many studies and articles have been done and written on this. Depression is linked to hopelessness. And so hope's a big deal. And every time we look at Christmas and we get to celebrate the Advent season, we need to be reminded that hope is a big deal because sometimes hope is all we have. Sometimes hope is all we have. So let's talk about Advent for a minute before we dive into our text this morning. Because some of us may not know this. The word Advent comes from a Latin word that is Adventus, which means the appearing arrival or official visit. Okay, appearing arrival or official visit. So the observance of Advent began around the 4th century A.D., okay, and was originally all about the second Advent. The, sec- the second Advent meaning the second coming of Christ, the, when Jesus was going to return. But then most recently, people have shifted the focus of Advent to the first Advent that we call Christmas, the coming of Jesus, the coming of the Messiah, the birth of Jesus. And so the purpose of celebrating Advent is to help get our eyes off of the secularization of Christmas, off of the normal wrappings and chaos and and all of that of Christmas. Anybody already sick of it? Okay, no, not yet. A couple of you, a couple of you. Man, I, I love a lot of things about Christmas, and then there's a couple of things that I don't. Anyway, um, but the purpose of celebrating Advent and doing this year after year after year and reminding ourselves of these things is to take our eyes off of, those, off of that stuff, not all of it, but just the things that get in the way and get in between us and the real focus of Jesus and to focus on the real meaning of Christmas, which is Jesus. And so each week of December, uh, to, starting today, is marked with a different candle that signifies a different aspect of Advent. And today, like we've already talked about, is hope. And so there's three candles, uh, the three purple candles, the one rose candle, and the one white candle. The, the, the candles represent Jesus and what he came to bring to us. And so that white candle in the middle represents Jesus. We'll light that one on Christmas Eve. And the other four, you have the hope candle that's burning now, and then we'll talk about you know, peace, and we'll talk about joy, and we'll talk about love candle. That's the rose candle, and then Jesus um, being in the middle. They represent Jesus and what he came to bring to us. And then the evergreens around it that we always um, are, try to be careful that they don't set on fire as well 
Um, the evergreens around it uh, represent life for those that are in Jesus. They represent the life for those that are in Jesus. And so they're arranged in a circle, right? And, we, and uh, there's no beginning, no end. The, eterni- the eternity of Jesus, the Alpha and Omega, the first and last letters of the Greek language, all of those things are important. But again, this morning, we lit the first candle, the hope candle. We live in an age where hope at times is on short supply, isn't it? And I say that, but let's, let's say the right kind of hope. Because the reality is we're all hoping in something. Right? We all have our hope placed somewhere. We, we're all hoping in something. For many of us, and, or for some of the people that we brought bubbles with, or do life with, or come in contact with, for a lot of people, the hope is just in the wrong place. Hope is in our children, hope is in our marriage, hope is in our job, hope is in um, a sports team, hope is in this, hope is in that, hope is in, is in the stuff that we have or we're going to have in the next three or four weeks, right? Our hope, it's, it's not that we don't hope, it's not that we don't know how to hope or how to have hope, it's just that our hope is in the wrong place. There's one place, one person, one being that we can place all of our hope and that's the God of the Bible. Why? Because He never changes. And because of what he's done for us. Now let's look at a few verses of scripture before we get to our main text this morning. Just talking about God being a God of hope. Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe. So that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Wouldn't it be awesome if that was a picture of the church this morning? May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe so that you may overflow with hope. So that you may overflow with hope. So there would be enough hope in the right place to go around. Look at Psalm 33. It'll be on your screen. We wait for the Lord. He is our help and our shield for our hearts rejoice in him because we trust in his holy name. May your love, may your faithful love rest on us, Lord, for we put our hope in you. And then lastly, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not become weary. They will walk and not faint. The text we're going to look at this morning actually comes from Isaiah chapter 40. We're going to look at verses 1 through 5. It's a big transition point in the long book of Isaiah. We're going to talk about that in just a moment, but I want to read it before we go any further. And Isaiah says this in Isaiah chapter 40, starting in verse 1. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Verse 3, a voice cries. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up. Every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. What a great passage. It speaks of the hope that we have in Jesus. And so I want to I want to talk a little bit about the history of, of Isaiah before this passage, and, and, and then I want to break this passage down just a little bit. So hang with me for just a few minutes. But this passage speaks of the hope that we have in Jesus, even though it was written, get this, 700 years before his birth. So this passage that we just read this morning, written 700 years before the birth of Jesus, speaks of Jesus. Isn't that awesome? Even though it was written 700 years before His birth, it called out to the people of God, and it calls out to the people of God now to put our hope in Jesus. The book of Isaiah was written by the great 7th century B.C. prophet Isaiah and has primarily two parts. There's basically two parts of the book of Isaiah. The first part, chapters 1 through 39, and so to sum that up for you, everything leading up to this point, to this text that we read this morning, it's written primarily to the people of Judah, warning them to turn from their spiritual complacency. 
first 39 chapters of Isaiah, written primarily to warn the people of their spiritual complacency and to seek God with all their heart and soul. It's a fiery text. If you were to go through the first 39 chapters, it's a fiery text, and it's scary what awaited them because of their indifference to God's way. Because of their indifference to God's way. God intends to send the Babylonians to be the rod of his discipline, and they don't know it yet, but within 100 years, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians will come in 586 B.C. They'll lay siege to the city, depriving it of food and water, and it would become so drastic, it would become so drastic that Jeremiah the prophet wrote during that time that mothers were going through extreme measures just for nourishment. The Babylonians would tear down the walls. They'd tear down the precious temple that was built by Solomon 400 years before. They would completely sack the city. They'd take it out. Then the survivors would be carted off into captivity for 70 years. I hope you see that this was not a very pretty picture. There was not a lot of hope in this situation in the first 39 chapters of the book of Isaiah. But now, in chapter 40, Isaiah shifts his focus from the next 200 years to a time in the future that would be a picture painted with colors of hope and optimism. He encourages the people of God to live rightly despite the present and future difficulties. I want you to hear that again. He encouraged the people of God to live rightly despite the present and future difficulties. He's infusing hope into their hearts that there will come a day when all will not be so bleak. And that's what the prophet Isaiah is doing here in this text. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Cry to her that her warfare is ended, her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. I think there's three things about hope that we need to point out here from this text. And the first one is this. Our hope is in this comfort. Our hope is in the comfort that God gives, that God brings. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. God wanted His people to know that despite the pain and suffering they were going through and would go through, He hadn't abandoned them. And I believe that God wants us to know today, because because let's be honest about something for just a moment. Let's be honest about something for just a moment. We said this in the first service. I think it bears repeating in this service. Christmas is not always an exciting time for families. Christmas is not always a time of rejoicing. It's not always a time where we feel like celebrating or anticipating, or waiting with expectancy for this Jesus, right? Because of something that's maybe happened in the last year or the last couple years. Maybe this is the first Christmas you're going to spend without that loved one. I'll never forget a couple years ago, standing up here at Advent and preaching the first hope message of Advent after my father had passed in June. I didn't feel like hoping. I didn't feel like having joy. It was going to be the first Christmas without my dad. That's a struggle. But no matter where you're at, no matter where you're sitting, no matter what you're going through, no matter what's happened over the last year or five years or ten years, maybe you're still dealing with that. God says, hey, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to abandon you. Comfort, comfort my people, says the Lord. Comfort, comfort my people, says the Lord. And so this Christmas may be looking different for you. This season may look different than it's ever looked for you. But the hope hasn't changed. The hope never changes. And what Isaiah is writing here, what God wanted His people to know is that in the midst of the pain, in the midst of everything, in the midst of it all, He had not abandoned them and the promise was that He would comfort them. Now I want you to see this, and this is going to be a little bit hard. You may have never heard this before if you're new or recent with us, but we got to go here. In this case, the pain and suffering was a direct result of their disobedience. 
The pain and suffering that these people were, were dealing with and were working through. And I wish we had time to go back and do an in-depth study of the first 39 chapters of Isaiah so that we could really see what had led up to this point. But the pain and suffering that they were going through was a direct result of their disobedience. And it could be, notice the word could, it could be that the pain and suffering you're going through right now is a direct result of you choosing your way instead of God's way. Now, before you jump to conclusions, but how could a loving God do, before you go there, hear me out. But if you're a child of God, even in the midst of disciplinary action, you can run to God for comfort. As a parent, as a parent, how many parents in the room? Yeah, yeah, okay, I see those hands, amen. Glad you're here, there's hope. There's hope. As a parent, we know that at times our love for our children prompts us to discipline our children, doesn't it? And at times that could even bring pain and suffering into their lives. And it's hard, right? How many of you ever heard? I, I heard it. Right? How many of you ever heard the line, this hurts me more than it hurts you? You know why it hurts so bad? Because what's the line where you step in? What's the line where you step in? And you say, okay, it's time for me to offer a hand. The other night, we have these bins, and, and, and I recognize that some of you are dealing with much bigger things, but you'll get the picture here. We, we have these bins of toys in our house. And you, you know the bins I'm talking about. The ones that um, usually the contents within the bins aren't the things that get played with, but the bins get grabbed and pulled away from the shelf and then they just flip them right upside down. And some of you parents know the sound of all of the contents of that bin hitting the floor. You can hear it anywhere in the house. You can even hear it like at Hannaford. Um, you know, five, six miles down the road, you just hear, and you're like, oh, no, not again. That's the 17th time today. Well, we've got about four or five of those bins. I don't know why. We shouldn't. Um, but uh, Ezra, our four-year-old, um, was having fun the other night, and he decided to make a train out of those bins. But the thing about the train was it couldn't have anything inside the cars. And so they all had to be emptied on the floor in another location. And so we were crying, and we were over in a corner, and um, just, just, you know. And anyway, he was creating this train, and it was past bedtime, so we're trying to get the kids to go to bed. And Ezra had this bright idea to come out, and he decided he wanted to stand on the train and be the conductor. And so these, these things aren't very strong. They're very flimsy. But he decided that it would be a good idea if he stood on both sides of one of these bins and conducted the train. And I told him before he stepped up there, hey, buddy, that's not going to be a good idea. You should really, really think about going to bed. I didn't say it that nicely. You need to go to bed, kid, right? But as I was getting him something so that he could go to bed and all that, he di didn't listen. Shocker. Stood on both sides of those, that bin, and before I knew it, I turned around, and his bottom, that's acceptable to say, right, had gone right down into the bin, and his legs are outside of the bin dangling, and his arms are dangling, and he's all like in this thing. Uh, and he says this. He says, a little help here? <laughs> Now, what had just happened was in direct disobedience to me, right? I mean, I had said, hey, buddy, not a good idea. You need to go to bed. It's past bedtime. Oh, forget that, Dad. This is going to be awesome, right? Standing on the edge of the thing, right down in there, a little help here. Now, I laughed. I laughed at his suffering, right? Because... He hadn't listened to me, right? If he'd have listened to me, he wouldn't have been stuck in the predicament that he was in. And so I let him stay there for a half hour. <laughs> it was only probably about 25 minutes. <laughs> Don't get too excited. No, it, I got him out of there, but it was so, like, you know, I wanted to just leave him in there and say, yep, 
found your bed for tonight. Good night, buddy. I uh, hope you sleep well, you know, because it was, it's frustrating because it was in direct disobedience to me. It was really funny because the situation he found himself in, right? And he's like, how long do I leave him there? And Kristen's like, you got to get him out. I'm like, no, but he didn't listen. But you get the picture. You get the picture. And we don't do these things as parents, right? Because we hate our kids. That's not the case. That's not the case. That's not the case. But we do it because we love them. And so Ezra and I had a conversation, I think it was Friday night, about, hey, when daddy tells you not to do something, probably a good idea if you don't do it, do it right? And he's like, yeah, daddy. But that was fun. <laughs> so we'll keep working on that one. But you get the picture. But then we got to talk about a different kind of pain and suffering. Some of us experience pain and suffering and we have little or nothing to do with it. Right? Some of us experience pain and suffering and we have little or nothing to do with it. And listen, I wish I had more answers here, but I just need to state a couple of things before we move on. We live in a broken world filled with broken people. There's diseases. There are different types of abuse and, and, and things like that. There are so many injustices. And, and, that, and I get asked about this stuff quite often. And, and I'll, be, I'll be honest with you. You know, I, I, said if, I said a couple minutes ago, how could a loving God allow this? I dealt with that very early in my ministry. The first funeral that I ever did was for a baby that was supposed to be born the next day. I had a wedding to do on that same day. That was the funeral. And the funeral was in the morning, and as I stood at, on a platform in North Carolina and looked down at this little casket, this little pink, precious casket for this baby named Kathleen, I'll be honest with you, there were a lot of questions that I had for God in that moment. And you know what God reminded me of? A verse in Isaiah chapter 55. Better His thoughts are not my thoughts. His ways are not my ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth are His thoughts than my thoughts. And it was like God whispered to me, hey, Travis, you're not going to understand everything this side of heaven. And that's okay. We're not going to understand everything, all the injustices, all the different abuse that we see happen on a day-to-day -day basis, all, all the disease that, that happens. We're, 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 not gonna, we're not meant to understand those things. We're not meant to understand the why behind all of those things, this side of heaven. But none of those things change the hope that is found in God. He's constant. And the hope that we have in Him because of His Son Jesus, which we're going to talk about in just a couple minutes, because of the hope that we have in Him, we, we can press forward. And we can be comforted no matter what we're walking through today no matter what we're walking through today. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul puts it this way, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. He comforts us in our affliction so that we might be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction through the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For as the sufferings of Jesus, for the sufferings of Christ overflow to us, so also Christ, our comfort, overflows. He's the God of all comfort. He's the God of all comfort. Number two, so our hope is in His comfort. Our hope is in His preparation. Our hope is in His preparation. If you look at verses 3 and 4, there a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. I, I can't help it. I can't help it. But you know what I picture here? I, you know what I picture here? Uh, like in Aladdin. 
Okay, the new Aladdin just came out. But Prince Ali, he's coming through the town. And you got, you got Will Smith that's singing and making all the preparations. And they got the monkeys. Every, okay, never mind. Anyway, some of you are with me. Some of you aren't. That's okay. But, but, but you see here in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley should be lifted up. Every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. There, were, there are two types of preparation that we see here. Two types of preparation. The first type of preparation is by God's people. Isaiah is calling out to God's people, hey, listen up. Prepare a way for Jesus. Jesus is coming. God is coming. God in the flesh is coming. And this is such a big deal that John the Baptist even quoted this verse when he announced the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry in, Mark, in Matthew chapter 3. He says, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent because the kingdom of heaven has come for he is the one spoken of through the prophet Isaiah who said a voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make his paths straight. Now, why was this important? Because in ancient times, when a king was traveling, Workmen would go before his entourage. They would go before um, all the animals and all the people that were traveling with the king. They would go before lowering the mountains, raising the valleys. So they were just leveling out the rough terrain for the king. We would say today that they were rolling out the red carpet. They were making things smooth. They were making the travel smooth for the king. Both Isaiah and John the Baptist were admonishing the people here for, to roll out the red carpet for Jesus. How do we do that? How do you roll out the red carpet for Jesus today? How do you roll out the red carpet for Jesus this Advent season? By opening our hearts to him. By removing anything that is keeping us from experiencing a close intimate relationship with him that's what we do to prepare the way for the lord that's why we focus on advent that's why we do the advent calendar that's why we do the things that we do around christmas because we want to make sure that not that all the other things are bad but that we keep the main thing the main thing and that we roll out the red carpet for jesus we open up our hearts to Him. We say no to the things that get in the way of Him. And so for you this morning, what is it in your life that you're holding on to that's keeping you from experiencing all the fullness that God has for you? Is it fear? Is it a sin habit? Is it a relationship? Is it unforgiveness? Whatever it is, we need to confess it. We need to repent of it. We need to remove it so that we can prepare our hearts for what God wants us to do. So the first type of preparation was by God's people. The second type of preparation was by God himself. Look again at verse 4. Every valley shall be lifted up. Every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. I want you to see here the absolutes. Only God could make a promise like that. And eventually God prepared the way for the Israelites to re return to Jerusalem after their captivity. Ultimately, he became one of us. Jesus became flesh to prepare the way to make us right with God. John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And Jesus continues to be the great deliverer, the great preparer. And so my question for you this morning, what wilderness do you find yourself in? What desert are you in that's leaving you parched and empty? What valley do you need to be lifted up out of? A few chapters later in the book of Isaiah, he states this, do not remember past events. Pay no attention to the things of old. I'm about to do something new. Even now it's coming. Do you see it? Indeed, I will make a way in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. And for some of us this morning, that's probably a verse we ought to claim for the next few weeks that God will make a way in the wilderness for us. So our hope is in His comfort. Our hope is in His preparation. That He's prepared the way. He's rolling out the red carpet. We ought to roll out the red carpet too. And the last one, our hope is in His presence. If you look at verse 5, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The glorious one would appear. All 
of humanity will see it. This is the language of of the incarnation of God. God in the flesh. Jesus the Messiah, the promised one, the chosen one. Philippians chapter 2, that that, that Jesus stepped out of heaven and He humbled Himself to make Himself nothing. In Christmas, we make much of the name Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. God with us. And He shall be called Emmanuel. God with us. Us. Jesus came that we could experience the presence of God. That is the source of our hope. That's the source of our hope. There's not a more important realization. There's not a more important promise for us when we're struggling with adversity, when we're struggling with discouragement, when we're struggling with fear. than God with us. Than the fact that God is with us. As we close this morning, I was reading this past week and hear me out on this. Over 62% of people say that they shop this time of year just to make themselves feel better. Now, if that's you this morning, listen, don't shop to make yourself feel better. Just shop for me. Okay? And I'll fix that. Let me help you with that, okay? Let me help you with that. I'm not picky. But as I read that, my heart kind of sank. And it it didn't sink because shopping is bad. No, 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 no. Go out and go, go, you know, go do your thing. Go do your thing. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to be the preacher up here that says shopping bad, church good, right? No, I mean, that's not the point, right? We even told you to go out and buy some, some presents for the giving tree, right? That's, that's not the point. The point is, are you keeping the main thing, the main thing? And the only thing that can truly make you feel good, the only thing that can truly, 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 truly cause you to live with hope isn't shopping. Not not the wrappings of Christmas and all the things that we're going to do over the next few weeks and the Christmas parties and this and that. Okay, none of those things. It's the presence of Jesus. And so if I could challenge you with something, as we talk about hope today, it would be this. How in your life, how in your family's life can you roll out the red carpet for Jesus this year? How can you roll out the red carpet for Jesus this year to flow right into your hearts, to flow right out of your house, to, to overflow among every person that you come in contact with? I believe there are two... There are two... Um, times of year saturated in our culture for it, where it's so easy to talk about Jesus, Christmas and Easter. And this is one of those opportunities where I was listening to the, one of the radio stations yesterday and a King, for King of Country song came on because and it's a Christian song on a secular radio station because, you know, everybody's playing, everybody's talking about Jesus on the radio. Everybody's, you know, it's, it's an awesome time. And we can capitalize on that because we can let the hope of Jesus overflow in us and we can roll the red carpet out for him. We can make the path straight. We can make the path, raise the valleys, lower the mountains so that he can flow right in and through us this Christmas. So what, what does it look like for you to roll out the red carpet for Jesus this Advent season? Our worship team is going to come And I just want to pray that over you. I want to pray that for you. And we'll close with a song and then I'll come back up and close this. But what does that look like for you? Father, I just pray that we would find our hope in you. God, that we wouldn't look to the things of this world, that we wouldn't look to each other, that we wouldn't look to any other source of hope than you. Because God, you've made a way for us to have hope. You've You've done the work. It's finished. And so God, I pray that we would rest in that. Comfort, comfort all my people. And so God, today I pray for a comfort for each person in this room that's supernatural.
And God, I just pray that we would rest in your presence during this season. Thank you for the chance that we get year after year after year to be reminded of these things. And I pray that it doesn't become old to us. I pray that it doesn't become routine for us to just walk through the next few weeks, but that, God, we would experience your hope, that we would experience hope in you fresh and anew today and this week, and that it would overflow into every person that we come in contact with. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you stand and sing with us if you're able?